Om Gyan Timiranda Sya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tas Mai Shri Guru Vena Maha Ma Om Vishnu Badaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Sami Iti Namaste Deve Lord of Ari Sesa Sunya Vari Pastyat Yade Satari Panchakalpataru Vesha Kripa Sindhu Bay Vesha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnava Bio Namahona Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> So we're happy to return after two days of activities in the area of Ratha Yatra and temple programs. And so we'll continue with our uh, series of verses on the third canto, 20th, fifth chapter. And these are very essential uh, verses that pinpoint some of the most important principles that make up the process of devotional service. We heard a little bit about, you know, how the devotional service works. Now, we're going to find out a little bit more about devotees now, which are the heart of devotional service. So this verse begins that series of few verses on uh, the devotees of the Lord. Prasangam ajaryam pa sam atmanam kavayo vidahu seeva sarushu krito moksha dwarma parvitam moksha dwarma parvitam. Translation Every learned man knows very well that attachment for the material is the greatest entanglement of the spirit, soul. But that same attachment when applied to self-realized devotees opens the door of liberation. Srila mm -hmm. Prabhupada's purport. It is clearly stated that attachment for all things upon the bondage and conditional life, and that same attachment when applied to something else opens the door to liberation. Attachment cannot be killed. It simply has to be transferred. Attachment for material things is called material consciousness. Attachment for Krishna conscious, attachment for Krishna is called, can't see that one word is blocking. Move, move the thing, move the verse a little bit. Just move it up or down more okay an attachment for krishna or his devotee is called krishna consciousness mm -hmm. consciousness is therefore the platform of attachment so we write in these few verses or a few lines here we have a very fundamental i mean right Prabhupada put so much in a few sentences <laughs> Attachment for conditional life is bondage. Attachment for something else opens the doors for liberation. Attachment cannot be killed. It can only be transferred. And attachment for material things is to consciousness. And Attachment for Krishna or his devotees is called Krishna consciousness. The consciousness is therefore the platform of attachment. Very succinct principles of devotion. Consciousness is therefore the platform of attachment. It's clearly stated here that we must simply purify the consciousness from material consciousness 
to a Christian consciousness, and we can attain liberation. Despite the statement that one should give up attachment, desirelessness is not possible for a living entity. A living entity by constitution has the propensity to be attached to something. We see that if someone has no object of attachment, if he has no children, then he transfers his attachments to cats or dogs. This indicates that the propensity for attachment cannot be stopped. It must be utilized for the best purpose. Our attachment for material things perpetuates our conditional state, but the same attachment when transferred to the Supreme Personality of Godhead or his devotee is the source of liberation. Here it is recommended attachment should be transferred to the self-realized devotees or sadhus and one who was a and who is a sadhu a sadhu is not just an ordinary man with a saffron robe or a long beard the sadhu is described in bhagavad gita as one who has unflinchingly engages in devotional service even though one is found not to be following the strict rules and regulations of devotional service if one simply has unflinching faith in Krishna, the Supreme Personality, he is understood to be a sadhu, sadhu eva samantavya. The sadhu is a strict follower of devotional service. It is recommended here that if one wants at all, if one at all wants to realize Brahman or spiritual perfection, his attachment should be transferred to the sadhu or devotee. Lord Chaitanya also confirmed this, lava matra sadhu sangha sarva city hoy. Simply by a moment's association with a sadhu, one can attain perfection. Mahatma is a symptom of sadhu. It is said that service to a mahatma or an elevated devotee of the Lord is dwarma hor vimukte the royal road of liberation. Mahatseva dwar mahor vimuktes tamo dwar myositam sangi sangam. This is from the Bhagavatam 552. Rendering service to the materialist has the opposite effects. If anyone offers service to a gross materialist or to a person engaged only in sense gratification, then by association with such person, the door to hell is opened. The same principle is confirmed here. Attachment to a devotee is attachment to the service of the Lord because if one associates with the sadhu, the result will be that the sadhu will teach him how to become a devotee, a worshiper and a seer servitor of the Lord. These are the gifts of sadhu. If we want to associate with a sadhu, we cannot expect him to give us instructions on how to improve our material condition, but he will give us instructions on how to cut the knot of the contamination of material attraction and how to elevate ourselves in devotional service. This is the result of associating with a sadhu. Kapila Muni, first of all, instructs that the path of liberation begins with such association. Mount Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutalain Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvase Sasuni Vari Pastyatya De Sitarine. So uh, desire is an indication of life. Where there is no desire, there is no life. Desire cannot be stopped in a living being, because desire is the principle of life. And then the question comes by, uh, down to what is that desire that is beneficial to the living being? Then we can see from this verse that one should a desire to free themselves from material entanglement, or we call it conditional life. Uh, conditional life means 
a life that has been formulated by a certain set of circumstances and within a certain range of uh, activities. And those circumstances mixed with desire and activity produces a type of life which is called condition, or you might even say conditional. It means it appears due to activities and desires within a certain realm of, acti of, of uh, existence. In this sense, the material existence. Spiritual existence is not conditional, it is constitutional. In other words, it's by nature our existence. It's not contrary and nor is it something that comes and goes. Conditional life means even within the conditional life, it can be changed to another type of conditional life. So we see that there are three levels of conditioning in a, in a general sense within the material energy. We have the mode of goodness, we have the mode of passion, and we have the mode of ignorance. Due to association with the material, we associate with one or a combination of these three modes of material nature. And based on that combination of activities and association with these modes of material nature, we develop a body. And according to Shastra, that conditional nature reaches its limit with 8,400,000 species of life. So from the bodily perspective of life, there are 8,400,000 ways to become, to, to develop the principle of conditioned life. And then how that plays itself out is even greater number. So one can be, have the same type of body as another soul, but still the conditioning could be different according to the association of the modes of material nature, even within the same type of body. So the conditional nature is on different levels or in different, uh, different moods of conditioning based on different types of desires or a combination of desires. That's why when we try to understand what is, we can't, it's not possible to clearly understand how the law of karma works because the complexity that makes up the laws is so diverse that uh, even Krishna talks about it in a way in which he says, no one can really understand how one becomes conditioned or what is the nature of that conditioning and how that conditioning pushes one towards their next destination in terms of the type of body that they receive. So it's quite complex, quite diverse, but it's all based on desire and desire within the realm of limitation or material. So, but then again, here, and of course, as Prabhupada establishes in the very beginning, that causes bondage. And so bondage means being controlled by some force outside of ourself that brings us various types of results, either suffering, um, uh, att uh, strong attachment for the temporary, or a feeling of uh, happiness based on certain activities. So we have the three modes. Goodness gives some happiness materially. Uh, and passion brings great longing for satisfaction. And ignorance brings simply suffering, that's all. <laughs> so we see how, how our conditioning nature is so works in such a way as to keep us in a limited state of existence, simply going back and forth. In the verses in the 
13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, uh, Karnam Gunasanga So Sarasa Jone Janmasu, that the living entity travels from one material situation to another. Karnam guna sango sho sarasa joni. Joni means birth. Janmasu. Janmasu means birth. So life after life, one takes birth in one of the three realms. Either in the realm of the demigods, the realms of the humans, or those below the humans, such as ferocious living beings, such as... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, lower forms of existence, such as Rakshastra, jinns, and various types of demoniac species of life, or even below that, animal lives. So the complexity of material energy is very, very hard to even understand. It's so complex. And therefore, you see... No two people in the world are exactly alike. And there are billions and billions of living entities who are conditioned in the material world and you don't find two people who are exactly alike. But you can see how diverse this conditioning is when you measure it based on this principle that even within identical twins, were born practically with the same karma, there is some difference. Slight is there, but there is some. So no, and you'll see even within the identif identifications that we uh, carry with us, such as our fingerprints, our voice, our, what else? These two things, no one has the exact voice. No one has the exact fingerprints. These things are unique to each and every individual. Just like even in the, the greater sense of the material energy, there's no two snowflakes alike. There's no two uh, leaves on any tree alike. Similarities are there, but differences are all there in some degree, no matter how small there is difference. So to get free from that conditional life, which pushes one to act and receive a resultant uh, action from that activity, one has to change their attachment to the spiritual. So in changing the attachment for the spiritual, as described in this verse, is step by step. One cannot simply go from getting attached to the, from the attachment to the material to the attachment of the spiritual without going through the different categories that indicate spiritual. If one tries to become fully attached to Krishna after being attached to the material energy, it's not possible. Even if one wants to, one cannot develop that attachment because of the condition nature of our previous attachment with the material energy. So what we have here is get attached to those personalities who are what we know as sadhus, that's described in this verse, they're called sadhus. Those who are fully engaged, unflinchingly, as it's mentioned here, engaged in devotional service. Through that type of unflinching attachment or flint, uh, attachment to those unflinching engaged in devotional service, then one develops the similar quality, qualities gradually. Attachment to a great soul means to do two things to the, towards the great soul. One is to hear from them and hear from them to learn from them, from learn from them to learn how to apply what they teach you in your own life and learn how to develop attachment 
for those instructions. Continue application. And that's one of the ways by one what gets attached to the sada, which is the main way. The second is also there, but it's not as, uh, what we say, prominent or effective as the other, but it can be under circumstances. So is there a variable there? And what is that? Doing service for the great souls. So by doing service to the great souls and rendering service to the great souls, rendering service to great souls, uh, one develops attachment for great souls, but it has to come along with the principle of sevaya or service according to their instructions. Mm -hmm. Or if they don't give what we say relevant, or not relevant, but uh, regular instructions, then learning what are the principal activities of great souls, which make them great souls, and following that and learning the application and how to, and how to receive the benefit of that application. So service to great souls and hearing from great souls, to put in a very succinct um, statement, is the success that opens up the door to real attachment. Otherwise, if we don't develop attachment to great souls or the instructions given by great souls, which are non-different than the great souls, then we remain attached to the material. And that's also a matter of degree because even when one begins to develop attachment to great souls, it's a process. It's a process of moving away from the material and entering gradually into the spiritual. But both things are happening simultaneously as one develops. Therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, tad vidhi patipatena paripasyena stevaya upadeksyanti te jnanam jnaninas tat padarshanaha. Because they have seen the supreme truth, or they are in contact with the supreme truth, they can give you knowledge of that supreme truth. They can also engage you in the service of that supreme truth. And they can also answer your questions regarding your activities in relationship to the supreme truth. Mm -hmm. So three things are there, seva, paripasyena sevaya, and Paripatena, Paripasyena, Sevaya. Three things. So as we become more and more attached to sadhus or great souls, uh, we our Krishna consciousness is, elevates more and more. And then because the great souls are attached to Krishna, we also become attached to Krishna. We also become attached to Krishna. So in our attachment to Krishna, we are developing it through the instructions and the attachment to great souls. Just like um, one devotee said to Srila Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, he was, he was a, a servant of Prabhupada. He said, Prabhupada, he said, he said, I don't have any attachment for Krishna, Prabhupada, but I have, I'm very much attached to you and my service to you. And Prabhupada said, that is good. That is the same thing. Because that will eventually lead to attachment to Krishna or development knowledge for Krishna which leads to attachment to Krishna like that. So it's a process like that. So this verse is very fundamental. We can use that word in this sense to understanding how to move forward in Krishna consciousness like that. Sometimes we develop attachment to something about Krishna consciousness aside from a developing attachment to the sadhu. But because the sadhus are also engaged in similar activities, but their engagements are different, 
The engagements are without personal motivation. Our engagements may be to engage in the same activities that the sadhus do, but we are looking for personal gain through these activities, which means they are still tinged by this element of material desire. It's just like sadhus take in order to serve the Lord and to honor the Lord in the form of prasadam. We might take the prasadam because it tastes nice, it's prepared nice, or something about the prasadam itself that we're attracted to, but not so much the person who is represented by the prasadam or the, the element of service. So you see the, the activities will be the same, but the motivation will be different. Although the motivation is not wrong, it's not pure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Purity ultimately is understood as perfection within activity or within desire, which leads to activity, which is also of the same nature. But when it's less, it's still purifying, but it hasn't reached its stage of perfection yet in terms of motivation. So therefore association, and here as um, this verse that was quoted by Lord Chaitanya Prabhupada quotes the, la the last line. I'll quote the whole verse. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastri Hoy, Lava Mata, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoy. Lava Mata. Lava Mata is an interesting, Lava Matra. Lava Matra means one eleventh of a second. If you could divide a, a second into 11 parts, one of them is called a Lava Matra. So that much time in association with a sadhu, then one can attain perfection. Now you might think, wow, is that just some kind of eulogy, some exaggeration, some hyperbole, some way to get you connected to sadhus? No, it's actually uh, uh, absolutely correct in essence. And what does it mean? Uh, I'll give you the example that was answered by Srila Prabhupada when he was asked the same question. And the question came in the form of some doubt. And the questionnaire, which was a disciple of his divine grace, he said, Srila Prabhupada, we've been associating with you more than many Lava Matras, but we haven't attained perfection. So what does this verse really mean? And Prabhupada clarified in a very interesting way. And he used an analogy to help us understand the clarification. And he said, um, when the wood, wood is wet, it doesn't ignite. If you try to light wet wood, it won't light because it's wet. So what has to happen first? The wood has to dry out, obviously. So the process of hearing and association with the sadhu is the drying process. We are still wet with material desires. So even though we're in association of sadhus and hearing from them, we have not attained perfection yet. So what is the, what is the answer? continue in that same way, continue to associate, continue to hear, continue to apply the knowledge given. And then gradually you get to the point of being dried out and then that perfection is attained. In other words, constant hearing and service to the pure devotee will bring one to the stage of perfection. So it's a process. This verse talks about the process, but it gives the result of the process within the verse itself. So it's interesting. Uh, therefore, we should be 
very eager for Vaishnava association, especially those Vaishnavas who are um, more elevated than us. Uh, senior association is required for us to move forward on the path of devotional service. And then there's two ways to associate with a great devotee. There's, there's Vanu, Vani and Vapu. means personal presence. Both are powerful, but Vapu, personal presence, can sometimes take one in the other direction. If one is not in the proper consciousness, when one is associating with great souls, they may also commit offenses to the great souls, which will take them away from making advancement in devotional life. But Vapu is not like that. Vapu is absolute by associating with their instructions, which means applying the instructions. That type of association not only is good when we are personally present or when the, so when the uh, great souls are personally present, but it remains so eternally. That's why uh, Prabhupada, for the, uh, those of us who had association with Prabhupada, understand that his association is still available through his words, his example, and how he gave his words and example to us as a way to learn how to practice Krishna consciousness. So that is eternal. Uh, whereas Vapu is nice because we can develop an attraction for a sadhu by that association. But because it's temporary and at the same time, it's also can lead one away. It is not as what we say recommended because there are many devotees who are fully engaged in devotional service to Srila Prabhupada who never met Srila Prabhupada. This shows you the power of Vani. It shows you the power of Vani, how his instructions taken to heart and applied in the proper way brings about that personal association. Just like I'll give you an example of what Prabhupada used to indicate that within him on his own self. When he was traveling um, in India, he came to his hometown, which was also the hometown of his Guru Maharaj, Kolkata. So he was there with some of his god brothers and they were going to different places in Kolkata. But Prabhupada didn't go to see the, uh, the Samadhi or the place of his spiritual master. He didn't go. He went to other places. Now his god brothers found fault with him later. He's coming, he's coming here and he doesn't go, even go see the place of his spiritual master. When Prabhupada heard of their criticism indirectly through other means, uh, through other people, Prabhupada said, they don't understand. I'm never separated from my spiritual master. I have never been separate. I'm always with him. I'm always with him. I am, I am following his instructions to the best of my capacity to spread Krishna consciousness all around the world. So that is association. But that's that association can bring attachment and the attachment can develop into greater forms of association. And that's the process of bhakti. So this verse is fundamental as it says in the, go back to the verse itself. Yeah, a little bit up. Oh, yeah, right. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Moksha Dharma Apavritam. Um, by that attachment, Moksha Dharma, the door of liberation, Apavritam, is opened. 
So liberation means freedom from everything material and ultimately is situated on the spiritual platform. Okay, these are some of the many uh, points that this verse is pointing to. So we can uh, stop here and open it up for comments and questions. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much. That was a wonderful class. This verse is so important. Thank you for the class, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, there is a question in the chat. Can I read it for you? Please. Mm -hmm. Yes, Hare, this is from Bhakta Roberto Prabhu. He's asking Hare Krishna, dear Maharaj, what if senior devotees don't want to associate with us? Do we just try to serve them or just try to associate with the other senior devotees? <laughs> He's giving some possible answers to his questions at the same time, <laughs> which may not be the answers at all. Um, say, <clears throat> say that person is your spiritual master. And then what do you do? And you just try to serve the instructions. We have an example in the life of Naratam Das Thakur, where Naratam Das Thakur wanted to take initiation from Lokanath Das Goswami. Lokanath Das Goswami did not want to accept disciples. He felt like he wasn't qualified and he really was more interested in doing bhajan instead of having disciples but lord chaitanya appeared to him and no actually what happened was naratam fixed his mind on lokanath das goswami and refused to accept the fact that he could not be his disciple so unknowingly, Naratam did service for Lokana. And he did very menial service. And finally, it was found out by Lokana Swami, someone was doing this service and he couldn't figure it out. And then he found out, when he found out, he was a little shocked. He was not angered, but he was shocked because Naratam is a prince. And he is more elevated in the material status than Lokanath Das Goswami was. And therefore, he felt embarrassed by accepting instructions. But then Lord Chaitanya appeared in a dream to Lokanath and said, you should accept him as your disciple. And he did. And that was his one and only disciple. So Naratam, because of his intense attraction to this great soul, then uh, that brought about his success in due course of time. There have been devotees also who have simply remained in the background and done service to Srila Prabhupada and Srila Prabhupada's devotees and have shown by their dedication in service that they are worthy of being accepted by these great souls and then in due course of time, they are accepted. Um, just like people come and say, well, I want to be your disciple. Well, that's nice. <laughs> but what are you going to do? It's not some, it's not like joining some club or getting a name or having a, you know, a change in dress. It's about purifying your consciousness and to, to develop your relationship with the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. And so that all starts with the mood of seva. So if you're trying to so associate with certain devotees who don't want to associate with you, and you still want to associate, do service for them. And don't expect anything other than to do the service. Just serve for the sake of service because you want to please them. 
But if you're thinking, I want to associate with them so I can discuss philosophical teachings with them and let them know how much I know about Krishna consciousness, then you'll obediently be rejected. You will never be able to get any kind of association with that mood. So that is not association anyway. Real association means to keep Krishna in the center. And that comes by seva. So don't go try going bouncing from place to place looking for senior association. When it comes to peer association, that is a little different. Peer association, we can do that by sharing Krishna conscious together and developing friendships based on our physical proximities. That we can do. But when you talk about senior devotees, then you have to develop that mood of seva and detachment from any personal desire. If you remain humble and respectful, then you'll get more mercy that way than if you try to force yourself due to some self-developed uh, qualifications that you think you have, which makes you qualified to develop that association. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Dipteshwar Prabhu, please go ahead. You have raised your hand. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, this is a very wonderful topic of association because there are so many subtleties here. Um, and I think you have already answered partly or maybe fully the answer on the question, uh, my first question which was, what is the right mood that we should develop when we seek association with senior devotees? And I think you answered partly in the sense that, or maybe fully, and you just try to serve without any expectations because most of the time or many times we have an expectations either from that association. And when we don't have that expectation fulfilled, we develop some av aversion, which then hinders our spiritual life. Yeah, just like the, the Indian culture, the culture coming out of India, is to invite senior persons to your home and offer prasad. But the motivation behind that is pun punya, is getting some benefit from that. And that's not completely... It's not bad, but it's not pure either. Pure means to want to please them by inviting them and offering nice foodstuffs and not so much what kind of punya will I get from that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when we're looking for personal gain, yeah, of course, mm -hmm. As Prabhupada writes in one, I mean, it's actually Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains it. Wherever there's a, a, a prayer, there is a desire for something. So we should try for association, but we know that association is beneficial for our spiritual elevation. And the mood of that association is to inquire and to offer service. It's that simple. Inquire, learn, and find opportunities to serve. And it's not always those opportunities for seva are not always available. Sometimes people want to do service to senior devotees, but that service is not available for whatever reason. Mm. And then one should hear from them. But if one gets a chance to serve them, one can do that. 
Thank you, Maharaj. I think this is this is clear. Uh, thank you. And uh, the second question, which is when we associate, there may be some instructions, and what should be our mood in taking those instructions? Because we become very selective in what we want to hear. Okay, so if you get an instruction, you know, that will happen too. If you get an instruction due to that association you didn't expect and something you don't want, then you inquire within that instruction and explain your feelings towards the instruction, either how you can carry it out or is there any other instructions you they could give Instructions can be modified also. And still keep the principle of instruction alive. But generally we don't instruct unless we see people are ready for accepting. Sometimes that chance is taken, but then we expect them to respond. So respond in one way means to question the instruction, question my, why I have received this instruction. What benefit will I get from this? Or if it's concluded, there is something that is even more, just like there is, just in general, this is a general principle. And this is unknown by most people that a spiritual master will not give instructions to certain devotees because he knows they can't follow it. But he gives it, he, give, he may give that same instruction to other devotees because they know they can follow it. If he puts his disciple in a situation where he gives them an instruction they can't follow it, they commit offense by calling called guru avagya that means disobeying their spiritual master's instruction and that rather than bringing them up they go the other way so the uh, guru doesn't want to do that he wants to bring his disciples up so he tries to give them instructions that are maybe a little difficult but something within their range that they can do But he knows certain disciples will not receive instructions because they can't follow that. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. This also clarifies. Mm -hmm. And there's technical words that apply to these two kinds of disciples. Ones who are completely surrendered and one who are, who are those who are conditionally surrendered. So when you get, if you receive an instruction, then you can question. If there's no reason to question, then accept and go on. You can also question how to execute the instruction why you were given that instruction. But these questions are presented in a humble way, not in a challenging way. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Mahatma, thank you. Hare Krishna. Because the whole bhakti process is service to seniors whether it's Krishna or Krishna's devotees, those in a more elevated place, that's the whole bhakti process. We can also do service to juniors and equals, and that's also part of bhakti. But that comes only by the instructions of seniors. Just like a 
a spiritual master might tell someone, one of his disciples, to preach. Um, and now, if they take up preaching, that's service to juniors because the conditioned soul is in a lesser position. But because it's an instruction by a senior disciple, uh, by a senior person, and it's in line with the whole mission of Krishna consciousness, it can be accepted as instructions given by seniors. Prabhupada gave that instructions to all of it. He said, I want all my disciples to preach. He said, each and if each and every disciple preaches, he said, Krishna consciousness will be spread in no time around the world. So that's something he, he doesn't, he's not forcing that on, well, why you're not preaching? But he's saying, this is what I want. So it's more like a direction rather than an absolute principle of instruction. And those who, those who take up that instruction become uh, very dear to the spiritual master. That's an example. But if one is fully engaged in devotional service, they also become very dear to the spiritual master. Everyone is dear, but then there's those who are very dear. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Shri Devi Mataji, please go ahead. Uh, dear Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, thank you for this uh, class on uh, how to associate the page Prabhu said it's so important for us to understand this. Um, my question is more regarding the instruction to chant every day. Um, the spiritual master gives the instruction that we should chant every day a certain number of rounds. Um, I find that when I'm chanting, even though the prayer is, oh my dear Lord, please engage me in your devotional service, I don't find myself in that mood when I'm chanting. I feel still very unqualified to ask for service. I'm thinking, first I need to get purified. So mostly when I'm chanting, I'm really praying to Krishna, please clean my heart. I'm, I have so many anarthas and then I can be ready for some service. So is this uh, a correct uh, mood and attitude and, uh, and activity when chanting? I'm not sure. You can't, sep you can't sec separate service and chanting. You're connected. That's why when you're chanting, you're actually as asking for service, whether you know it or not. <laughs> it's there within the mantra itself. That is the explanation of the mantra by given by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. You are asking for service. Although consciously you might think you're not, or you, because you feel like you're not well and ready to take on more service. So, but you are asking, and therefore you're going to get the opportunity. But if you, therefore, if you're chanting, and you're not engaging in service, your, your chanting won't develop beyond a certain point. So sometimes we think we, we can't really perfect our chanting is because we're not serving. We're not doing practical service also. On the highest platform, or the higher platform, we might say, uh, chanting and service amalgamate themselves into one. But that's on the on the liberated platform. Before then, then 
we are chanting and asking for service. And if we don't accept service, then we won't, our chanting won't go beyond a certain level. Mm -hmm. If we consciously refuse service, you're making it sound like out of humility, we're not qualified, but that's not a valid explanation because everyone can do service. Everyone can find some means to serve. Yes, thank you so much for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, there is a question uh, by Hetal Mataji. Uh, she's asking, um, Hare Krishna, Hetal, Hetal Mataji. Mm -hmm. She's asking, okay. uh, please, uh, how how we can make sure that our devotional service is in mode of goodness? Well, you see, you see the characteristics of the mode of goodness, and you apply those characteristics to the activity you perform. So, what are the activities of the mode of goodness that are mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita and throughout the Bhagavatam? Mogu goodness is still material, but it's a stepping stone to the spiritual. So developing the qualities of the mode of goodness means acting within the mode of goodness. If we um, read the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions the qualities of the mode of goodness, passion, ignorance, he also mentions the qualities of knowledge. He also mentions characteristics of the devotee. Just like, for instance, uh, uh, chapter 16, which is called Divine and De Demoniac uh, Natures. The first three verses, which is come together as one verse or one, one translation, is all the good qualities of the mode of goodness. And there's a list. Read that verse, the 16 in the chapter 16, verses one through three. And you'll see the 16, the, the qualities of the mode of goodness. Again, in the 18th chapter, Krishna mentions that in relationship to the Brahmanas. And again, in the 12th chapter, or 13th chapter, he mentions the, the 20 items of knowledge. And in many other places, he mentions the, the 26 qualities of a devotee. That's mentioned in three or four places in the Bhagavatam. Verse, uh, Canto 5, chapter uh, 18, verse number 12. 5, 18, 12, 26 qualities of a devotee are mentioned. So read those qualities, learn them, and learn how to apply them. And gradually, you can raise yourself up to the mode of goodness as you perform service. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, there is a question by... Mohanasini Radha Mataji, um, she's asking, what could we do if our neighbors get disturbed because we don't sleep much? They feel disturbed if we get up early, for, early, for example, uh, but if we could wake up late, my Japa and spiritual life would get disturbed. I usually sleep around six hours only. So if I go to sleep at 10 p.m., I'm awake at 4 a.m. already. I don't want to disturb anyone. I try to be always quiet and not to make any noise, but our floor is wooden and our neighbor can't sleep after I make even one step. I don't know what to do. You're um, living in the wrong you're living in the wrong place. <laughs> 
So I, <laughs> the material life, the people in the material world are always disturbed about something. Prabhupada constantly was talking about how our kirtan was disturbing the neighbors, how our you know, gathering of so many people in our temple was disturbing the neighbors. People are always disturbed about something. <laughs> what can you do? Tell, uh, maybe you can, if you really want to stay there, fix your floor so it doesn't squeak. <laughs> That's a practical thing you can do. Make your floor quiet so your neighbors are not disturbed when you walk. It might cost you a little bit of money, but... <laughs> You can do one of three things. You can just continue on the way you're going and just let them be disturbed. <laughs> or you can <laughs> fix the floor and relieve their disturbances. Or you can find some other neighbors. <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> so Mohanasani Radha, what are you gonna do? All right, think about it. Well, we shouldn't give up our spiritual life because of neighbors. I'm living in a situation where I have karmi neighbors or materialistic neighbors right across the hall from where I'm staying. And if I play the kirtan too loud in my apartment, um, they get disturbed. Like one time I left the door open when I went outside into the hall and the kirtan was playing and then my neighbor came out and started talking to me about my, about my loud kirtan. So, you know, I try to temper my, the volume so he's not so disturbed. And that's not hard to do. It doesn't, you know, that's an easy adjust, adjustment for me. So you, yeah, Prabhupada talked about that a lot. They had problems in India, they had problems in the West. One Chinese landlady, she would come running into Prabhupada's room and start yelling at Prabhupada when he was giving a lecture. <laughs> she was the landlady in the place that they were staying. And Prabhupada, he didn't really, even respond to her, he just he just remained quiet. When she got tired of yelling at him, she left, and then Prabhupada went back to his lecture. You know, so what can you do? <laughs> you just have to use your intelligence, not to cause disturbances if you can. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, yeah, even I faced such situation, Maharaj. Uh, my neighbor used to get disturbed with the home programs. So she used to complain, but I continued with my programs and recently she moved to another place. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, yeah. Yeah, well, sometimes it's the other way around. It's the devotees are living near people who have loud parties and they stay up late. Yes. Devotees can't sleep. Vindavan Nath Prabhuji has a next question, Maharaj. So. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I have one question. Uh, uh, see, from last several months, while uh, listening to your uh, these daily lectures and lectures, uh, every class has at least one or sometimes many instructions. And this question always goes in my mind because everything what you say, like what kind of quality we should develop or sometimes what we should avoid, what we should do, is all instructions. Uh, while I will be trying to follow a few gradually, but not able to follow all completely. So will that be also considered Guru Maharaj as an offense? 
No, not in lectures. Lectures are in general for people in general. We speak and we hope people will take, but, when, but if you get direct instructions, then that's different. But if you can take what comes in the lecture and benefit from it, obviously you'll move, you'll, you'll gain from that and move forward. But it's not that the spiritual master gives a lecture and he expects everybody in who's listening to follow everything that he said. Sometimes we speak from the absolute platform and sometimes we speak from a less absolute platform, a more relative platform. And then again, you have to understand how that instruction applies to you. The application is also just as important in, in getting the benefit as the instruction is. So take whatever you can take and be benefited. But then again, we say, try to take as much as you can. But then again, you should know which instructions are most important and which are supportive to the most important instructions. So when we say every day you must chant your rounds, that's most important. Every day you must hear Bhagavatam, that's most important. Every day we should be thinking and we should be doing some kind of service to the spiritual master or to the spiritual master's instructions. So you got general things and you have specific. Lectures are more general. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Is that, is, that, is that clear? Yes, Guru Maharaj, very much. I was really feeling like when you started this lecture today, that, oh, Krishna, I might be like, like, because every day, like when I note one or two points, it's like the list is getting bigger, bigger, bigger. But it helps in terms of uh, correcting myself where I am and what needs to be done gradually. So, well, that's the important thing. What needs to be done? Now you're the purpose of hearing is to learn yes. to learn and then application is the next step yes Guru Maharaj thank you very much Hare Krishna yeah I'll give you an example of the benefit uh, is this like a per there is a person who's not surrendered? They're not surrendered to a particular aspect of devotional life. And so they keep hearing that same instruction and they can't really do it or they don't want to. Maybe they can't for whatever reason. But then something happens in their life which forces them to adhere to that instruction. So when that thing in their life comes up as a way to direct them back to something that they needed to do, then it happens. So just like we say, well, the material world is, you know, we give you, give you the example of the man sitting on the branch of a tree and he's sawing on the inside of the branch and he's sitting on the outside. Another man comes along and said, my dear sir, if you keep sawing, you're going to fall. And he just kind of ignores him. And then when he keeps sawing, he falls down and he goes running to the man. Boy, you are, you are a great philosopher. You could actually understand the future. So the spiritual master is preparing you. And then material energy is helping you to fulfill that instruction. But that's a severe case. I'm using that as an example. 
we should hear, try to understand and see what we can apply. And that is, that is perfect in that sense. Yes, Guru Maharaj. I think one thing uh, which uh, has changed, like earlier in the material world, it used to be hearing and then maybe sometimes trying out like whether it's going to work or not. Now, especially after, uh, like in one class you mentioned and Prabhupada also mentioned in Nectar of Instruction purport that uh, we should just try to have faith by hearing rather than trying and seeing, then it's like foolishness. Like if you have faith, just hear and follow. So, Yeah, but then you have to see how, how it applies to you. If it's, a specific, if it's a general instruction for everybody, then go, yeah, then yeah. But if it's a, an instruction that's, that requires, that has details to it, there are specifics in it, then you have to question that. And you may also see what is your situation in relationship to what is being given. You know, and basically it comes right down to one statement. Krishna consciousness means to use your intelligence. <laughs> That's true, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, devotees, is there any more question or comments? Uh, Maharaj, I have a question. Is that okay? Uh, do we have um, time? If it is late. Yeah, uh, for, yeah. no, it's, it's fine. Okay, uh, Maharaj, the, uh, it is mentioned uh, in the purport uh, about attachment to service, but I was wondering how much it is good to be attached to the service because uh, uh, we, we see that some devotees who have been doing service for many, many years and then they get attached to the service and it is very hard for them to share it with new devotees or give it to them and new devotees also need some service in order to feel motivated and encouraged to move ahead in Krishna consciousness. So what do we do in that case, Maharaj? Like, is, it, is it good to be attached to the service uh, in such in the cases? Beginning, in the beginning, it's good to be attached to the service. And as you develop, you have to be attached to this, the person you're serving, Krishna. So Krishna tells you, do another service, you should be willing to do that rather than being attached to that service. But mm -hmm. the idea is to So if you're attached to the service, that's good. That's good. Okay. But just like, you know, say you attached to chanting your rounds at a certain time and then some emergency comes up where you have to, to do that as an emergency service. Say they, they ask you to dress the deities during that time because there's nobody else available. I'm attached to my attached to my chain at this time. And then that's that's for you. You're acting on the on the personal platform. So emergencies will cause one to give up their present service in order to do something that is needed. But generally, stay attached to your service. And realize that your service is for Krishna, it's for Krishna's to understand why you're serving and who you're serving. So it's better to be attached to the person you're serving than to the service, but the service helps you get attached to the person you're serving. Because in devotional service, the service is absolute. It's also Krishna in the form of service. So 
So it's good to get attached to service, yeah. But getting attached to a particular service uh, is also a fine as long as it doesn't interfere with a situation which is more important. If you find yourself in a situation where you have to give up the service to do something else, then that's that's what you should do. But stay attached to your service because your service is Krishna, is actually a, your connection to Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, I have to make an uh, announcement. I am uh, traveling tomorrow all afternoon from one o'clock probably until about eight o'clock my time. And uh, during that period, um, our class time is included in that. So it looks like the circumstances is maybe tomorrow, just tomorrow, you can find uh, someone or you can have Kirtan or maybe one of the devotees would like to come forward and you could read from the Bhagavatam and start a discussion based on your reading. That's one alternative. Or you can, or someone can come forward and do a class. So uh, I think you can decide amongst yourself what route, what course you want to take for just for tomorrow. Aribaria. Is Lava yeah, Lavanya is there? Yeah. Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. All rest to Shila Prabhupada. Um, yes, Guru Maharaj, sure. Um, I will discuss with devotees. Vrindavan Nath Prabhuji will be the host tomorrow. Um, I'll discuss with him and, uh, and do something, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, keep it going. Sure. Keep everybody enlivened. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj, sure. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj, for a wonderful class today. All the beautiful question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you for your time and association. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Jai. Jai. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. So we'll see you on Wednesday. Hare Krishna. Thank you.